ask you to stand, please, as we read from God's Word from Matthew chapter 6. As we continue our look at the Lord's Prayer this morning, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you again for this opportunity to come to your house, Lord, to be with your people, but most of all, to be in your presence, to worship and to praise your glorious name, to bring honor and glory to you, Lord, because you're worthy. Lord, we thank you so much for this great prayer that you have given us to learn from, to pray, to understand. Father, we pray today as we look at this last verse of this prayer in Matthew, that, Lord, you would enlighten our minds, that you would touch our hearts. Lord, that we may understand and we may gain strength and knowledge from your word so we might serve you better. Father, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross this morning. Speak through me. Anoint me afresh. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, be acceptable and pleasing unto thee. We bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus' disciples had asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gave them this prayer. You might say simple prayer, but it's not simple if you look at it. It might be short. But it's powerful, and it's, it has great meaning. And we have talked about um, the first part of this prayer, and, and last week we finished talking about the forgiving of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And this morning we look at the statement, and lead us not into temptation. You know, temptation is probably the world's oldest problem that is recorded in history. Now, there might have been a problem before that, but Scripture does not mention it. But there was the situation of Adam and Eve being tempted. We all have weakness. We all have tempers. We all maybe sometimes eat too much. Sometimes we spend too much. There's many things that we are tempted to do that maybe we ought not to do. Sometimes in our lives, some things are out of our control, but many things are under our control and we either give in to things we either walk to the right we walk to the left we make decisions and many times those decisions are not good decisions and we want to blame sometimes our bad decisions on someone else or something else but scripture is clear that God tells us not to give in to temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way to escape so that you are able to bear it. Temptation is not a sin. Temptation is not a sin. Everybody is tempted. Temptation is a normal part of life. We are all in the same boat when it comes to temptation. Now, we might be tempted by different things. We might be tempted in different areas, but we all are tempted. And there are common temptations that might be for all of us, and there are temptations that might not be for all of us. If it was a sin, and remember I said if, if it was a sin to eat chitlins, I would never be tempted to sin. I just would know that it would not be my temptation. It's not a sin, y'all, but if it was, now, if it was a sin to drink Mountain Dew, I would fail many, many times. 
There are different things in our lives that tempt us. But those things we can control. Even though temptation is powerful, Scripture has just told us, and I read in 1 Corinthians, that it is not more powerful than you and the Lord. It is strong, but it's not as strong as you are when you are holding God's hand. It is difficult to, to reject temptation, but it's not so difficult that it cannot be done if you allow the Lord to lead you and guide you. If you allow the Lord to, to, to help you through those temptations. Temptations come from outside. Temptations come from within. There are many types of temptations. But the battle can be won if we would just understand how to win it. Now, how do you win the battle of temptation? How do you win? How do you stop falling for the traps that are in front of you? You hold Jesus' hand. You read God's word. You grow in his grace and his knowledge. You become stronger in your walk. You spend time praying to the Lord. You know, if you want to learn to do something, be whatever it is. It's football season. So let's, football season starts the day they tell me. Professional. If you want to become a football player, the thing you need to do is sit at home and sleep, and you'll become the best football player in the world, right? No. If you don't do anything but sit home and sleep, you'll never become a football player. You have to go out there and learn the game. You have to go out there and practice. You have to go out there and, and work the drills. You have to go out there and play the game. Same thing is about overcoming temptation. You got to do something. You got to read God's word. You got to pray. You got to put things into practice. If I want to be a, a bodybuilder, I'm not going to be a bodybuilder by lifting this piece of paper. You know, I can, I can lift this piece of paper 100,000 times a day if my arm was staying that long. But it wouldn't build up my muscles. Why? Because this piece of paper not, don't weigh anything. It doesn't put anything against me. No force. If you want to grow... If you want to overcome your temptations, you got to have those temptations in front of you and you got to fight through them. You got to fight through them. You just can't completely ignore them. You got to fight through them. You have to become stronger by reading God's word, by praying, by holding his hand and going through them. Now, many times we want to avoid temptations. Now, some temptations we all need to avoid because some temptations are stronger than others. We don't need to start trying to attack the major temptation, the strongest one that, that, that affects us the greatest. Maybe we need to start, we really need to start at the small one. Overcome them and build our way up. But you have to start. You have to build your way up. Jesus here is saying, lead us not to temptation. He's not saying, Lord, don't never let them have a temptation. He's saying, Lord, help them to fight against it and not to give in to it all the time. Help them not to give in to them. Help them to have the strength. But the strength is something we must desire and we must want. Now, I want to tell you something. God never tempts you. God never tempts you. Satan will tempt you. The world will tempt you. But God will never tempt you. He can't do evil. He can't put evil in front of you. He can't tempt you with evil. The world and Satan will do that, but not God. But, on a side note, let me help you understand. God will test you. 
He will test you. Now, you say, well, preacher, what's the difference between a temptation and a test? A temptation usually leads to evil. A test usually leads to learning something. To learning something. To overcoming. To growing. God will test you. But God is not testing you so he can find out the answer. That's not why God tests you. God tests you so you'll find out the answer. God already knows the answer. God already knows how you're going to act. God already knows how you're going to react to things. God knows that. The thing is, we don't know that. We don't know it until we go through it. Until we face it. Until we have to, have to um, go through something, we don't know how we'll react to it. You know, many times we, we tell people, I know exactly how you feel. No, you don't. Not unless you did it, had the exact same thing happen to you. That's the only way you'll know how they feel. We think we might know, but thinking and knowing are two different things. I heard people say, well, I'll tell it like it is. No, you'll tell it how you think it is. <laughs> That's the problem. You tell it how you think it is. You might not know how it is. Only way you know how it is is when you go through it and you conquer it and you understand it, then you might know it. So God helps us by testing us to grow us so we may become mature in our faith. It says, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Folks, evil is a reality. Evil is real. It's not some made-up um, idea. It's an embodied individual. And here, we refer to it as Satan. There is a being who is evil. There is a being who thrives on doing evil. He has imps and demons who thrive on doing evil. Now, don't ever let anybody tell you, oh, Satan's just a made-up thought. No, Satan is a real individual that God kicked out of heaven and with his demons kicked them out, and they are here to destroy all of God's creation. They are here to, to harm what God loves. They're here to, to do things that would hurt God. Now, as I said, Satan don't care about you. You just are nothing in his mind. But he will use you or hurt you or do something through you so he might hurt God because he knows how much God loves you. We need to stay away from evil. Scripture says to flee, to run from evil. Evil will destroy and will hurt. And Jesus said that they are to deliver, that God deliver us from evil. Now, how we deliver from evil? First, we have to be strong in the Lord and in his might. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 says, Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the devil's schemes. So how do we resist evil? We put on God's armor. We, we understand that God is going to be there for us. We ask for God's help. Lord, keep me from evil. Lord, keep me from evil. Lord, keep me from the evil one, if you would. Lord, help me to resist. Help me to stay away. Help me to fight. Focus your attention on the Lord, not on the evil. You know, many times we, we put our attention on the bad things instead of the good things. And the thing that we think about the most is what's going to manifest itself out in our lives. If you think about bad all the time, you think about the bad things all the time, you're going to be grumpy and complaining. That's why some of y'all are grumpy and complaining. <laughs> because you think about all the bad all the time. If you think about the good, though, you know, are you a half-empty kind of person or a half-full kind of person? Are you a cloudy person 
or a partly sunny person. I mean, how are you? Where is your mindset? Scripture said the battle's in the mind. That's why it says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We resist evil by the thoughts that we have, the attitudes that we have, the things that we do, our actions. Stay away from evil. Stay away from that, one, that thing that is evil. Young people might not understand this, but y'all older people will understand this. Long ago, when my granddad had pigs, he would tell me to go slop the pig. Now, y'all old people understand what that means. And young people might not. I mean, go feed the pigs. But I learned if I stayed in the pig pen too long, when I got out, I smelled like the pigs. Because that smell got on top of me, got in my clothes, got in my hair. And I would have to go and take a shower or a bath to get it out. Well, the same thing is with evil. If you stay in evil long enough, if you stay near evil long enough, if you stay near bad things long enough, you're going to smell like it. You're going to act like it. If you listen to bad words enough, you're going to start talking that way. If you start hanging around people who are doing bad things, you're going to do those things. How many young people have I dealt with year after year, and they have said, Preacher, Miss Frank, I really didn't want to do it, but all my friends are doing it, and they just, till I did it too. Well, that's because they shouldn't have been there doing it with them. If you don't go to those places, you won't do those things. If you don't listen to that, language or those songs or whatever, you won't have it in your mind and come out of your mouth. Oh, Miss Frank, it's not going to affect me. I, I can, I'm not going to act that way. I'm not going to talk that way. Yeah. You fooling yourself or you ain't fooling me. When we stay around evil, it affects us. So we have to get away from that. And then it says, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory. God's kingdom. He owns everything. He is the one who is in charge. He was before all things. He created all things. He upholds all things. He is above all things. He knows all things. He accomplishes all things. He rules all things. He controls all things. God is in charge. Now, for the last week, we've been watching the weather. And watching these weathermen predict it's going to go here. This storm's going to go here. It's going to go here. I guarantee you God knew last week. God knew last month. God knew last year. God knew for the beginning time where that storm was going. He didn't have to guess. He didn't have to throw up some model in the air. He had to put a balloon up, a fly plane. God knows and controls all things. You say, well, preacher, then, if God knows and controls all things, why does he allow bad things? Well, the question, the answer is God didn't allow bad things. We messed this world up. I don't see in Genesis there being a hurricane nowhere. When you read Genesis 1 and 2, there was no hurricanes. We did all that. We sinned and made this world into a place where things happen. Scripture says the whole world, the whole earth moans and groans because of our sin. God made this place a perfect place. But sin has consequences. Not only to ourselves, but to the whole entire world. It's God's kingdom. It's his power. He is in charge. There is no one greater than him. There is no one stronger than him. There is no one who has more strength than him. There is no one who can do anything greater than him. I don't care how smart men gets to be. I don't care how, how much advanced in science we come. We still won't be able to stand, understand God's power and how strong and mighty and great he is. And it says quickly, in all glory, God will receive all the glory. 
Now, right now in our world, everybody's not giving God glory. Everybody is not praising the Lord. The scripture says there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that God is God and Jesus is Lord. He will receive all glory one day. But let's start giving to him now. Let's don't wait until we have to. Let's do it now. Let's understand in our minds and our heart that God is to be praised. That God is to be worshipped. That all glory and honor belongs to him. And let's lift him up with our lives, with our mouths, with our actions. And give him the glory that he is due. What a wonderful prayer that God has given us to teach us how to pray. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we ask that you would help us to pray. Thank you for giving us this prayer that we can learn. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand the parts of it. Lord, we pray today that you would not lead us into temptation, but you will deliver us from all evil. For truly yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. We bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you stand, sing the first verse. Uh, is your all?